Hello and welcome. I'm here with Jack Adair, Product Marketing Specialist for Canon Europe. And we are talking all about the live multicam solutions that Canon provides. So Jack, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Please tell us a little bit about what's going on here. Yeah, so um, here we are showing off the entire Canon imaging ecosystem. Um, all our products are known very well for being standalone, uh, for fantastic image quality, cinematic quality, things like that. What we've done here is we've shown how they can be all married together in one live multicam environment. Now, looking around, we've got, as we said, a variety of products. I'm, I'm seeing PTZs, I'm seeing XFs, I'm seeing large format cinema cameras. Do you want to maybe take us through? Let's start with the PTZs and, and go from there. So PTZs on the stand, we have our newest CRN700, which was launched a few days ago. Uh, this is our 4K 60p uh, top-end flagship model. Um, that's met, uh, just below the CRN500, uh, 4K 30p, 15 times zoom. Um, and of course the CRN300, uh, the smaller, more compact version uh, with its half point three inch sensor and 20 times zoom, uh, all packed, packed with loads of IP streaming and control capabilities. Now within this, I know we've got these three showing here that are the indoor cameras, but there's also some outdoor cameras that would fit into this environment as Certainly. well? Certainly. So on the stand we have um, two cameras which are dedicated for outdoor use. So we have the top-end CRX500, uh, which has its 12G SDI, uh, 4K one-inch sensor um, and IP55 rated body um, and can be controlled on our RCIP100 controller via a serial connection. Uh, we also have the CRX300. Uh, this has the half point three inch sensor with a 20 times zoom and an IP65 rated body and a whole host of IP streaming and control protocols built in. So Looking over to the far side, we've also got an XF over here. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so the XF605, which is uh, traditionally seen as a run and gun ENG style camera, very rugged. Uh, here we have it in a more studio environment. Um, so with the XE protocols, um, we want to show how it fits in. As I mentioned, the Canon imaging ecosystem, we're trying to show that as many of our product ranges of our cameras can fit into one live multicam solution. Okay, now just, you mentioned protocol. Now that, in, in terms of a live multicam setup, that's clearly the most important thing, I guess. We'll get on to the, the large format cameras in a minute, but I want to just understand a bit more about this protocol and how yeah. it works. So the XC protocol, we introduced it when we launched the CRM500 and CRN300. Um, this obviously controls the PTZs, but sorry to say this word again, but when we're talking about the ecosystem, you need to have this protocol in the cinema cameras, uh, in the XF camcorders as well. So what this means is this gives you a full range of choice for different types of image quality uh, and different types of control. Um, so it gives you full flexibility when setting up a multicam solution. Okay, amazing. So is, this is a, like a, a Canon developed protocol? 100%, yes. Absolutely. Okay, now, just into the other cameras, we've got some, some large format, more cinema style cameras Indeed. in a live multicam. Um, so as we know in live, that cinematic look is uh, becoming increasingly popular. Uh, so we have the uh, EOS C300 Mark III uh, with our new EU V3 expansion unit, okay. um, which as we've uh, discussed in many of the videos on the stand, that this enables our cinema cameras to turn into that live production style camera. Um, and we have that paired with our CN7 wide angle cine servo lens, um, which again, the marriage between ENG and cinema optical quality um, to give that cinematic wide angle look. Fantastic. And so that's something we're seeing more and more in the market, obviously, is that, that move from more broadcasty, I guess, to more cinema look. And, and Canon are enabling that with their yeah. solutions. 100%. Um, and I think that touches on then the next camera, the C500 Mark II. Uh, this has the new CN8 wide angle lens with the 1.5 times extender, which means you can now cover full frame in a live production environment. And to do that, we've partnered obviously with Multidyne. This gives that traditional fiber system uh, that broadcasters are used to working with. Now partners, keyword, obviously Canon cameras, lenses, the optics, all of that kind of side of things. But how about the partners that make this yeah. Work. So uh, to have a multicam system, uh, you wouldn't be anywhere without partnering um, with different elements uh, to really bring out the best in the production. So uh, as I touched on, we have Multidyne. Uh, these guys make fantastic fiber transmission systems for live broadcast. Uh, these can sit on the back of our C500 cameras, C300 cameras um, to give that transmission to an OB van, to a gallery, um, all sorts of things like that. Uh, we have Scarhoy, uh, these are the RCP control, um, so when you're working again, the OB or the gallery, this gives the engineers uh, the ability to fine-tune all the images uh, across our cinema camera lines and things like that. 
Uh, you'll see Mosis, uh, who we've also partnered with for the XR. Um, we have their MoRail system. PTZs obviously give you fantastic flexibility with pan, tilt and zoom. What this adds is another level of movement, of panning, that you can do to actually move the camera position around the studio as well. Um, and then we have Roland. What would a multicam solution be without a video switcher? Um, if you've got five, six cameras going in, obviously as we need to know, you need to switch between the live, the preview, everything like that to get the most out of a multicam situation. Um, last but not least, just above us here, uh, we have the Sear Vision Suite auto tracking system. Uh, what this does is it means our, our PTZ cameras uh, can essentially track a subject on stage, whether they're giving a speech or a lecture, um, without an operator having to actually move the cameras around. Okay, so a full suite of partners involved here that are creating a, a system that, that I guess just works in that live multicam solution. 100%. Brilliant. Well, look, thank you very much for, for taking the time to talk to us about it. Um, it's certainly exciting to see where this is going and, and see the marriage between PTZs, XFs, large format cinema and all the partners to enable further productions to, to, to go further, to do more uh, and open up creative possibilities. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you. I'm here talking with Aaron, a product marketing specialist for Canning Europe. We are talking all about XR Studio. Now, this is a, an incredibly interesting growth area of cinematography, of filmmaking, and Aaron's going to tell us all about it and how Canon has a solution that integrates into this new virtual world. So, Aaron, please. Hey, Dave. How are you doing? Good, thank you. How are you doing? Yeah, very well, thank you. Please, tell us a, a little bit about this. What is an XR Studio and, and how does it fit in? So XR Filmmaking is yeah. developing at an incredible rate right now and the possibilities of what you can do are just endless. You can go from being on a sunny beach to the top of Mount Everest within seconds, just in the same place, going from one destination to another. And that's really a whole nother way of filmmaking. It can help reduce costs and, tra and travel. It's more sustainable and it's helping collaboration with the talent who's on screen to understand where they are, as well as between the DOP and the post-production world. So it really is the future of filmmaking. And here we're showing how Canon can integrate with that with our cinema cameras and lenses. So we've got a variety of Canon cameras set up here. Tell me a little bit about them. Sure, so we've got our C500 Mark II here, our flagship cinema EOS camera, as well as our C300 Mark III. And these cameras have incredible uh, functionality that can help with virtual production, including having organic color science and having a low pass filter that can help suppress moray patterns, which you can see when you start recording digital screens. And that's something that helps make it more realistic. And finally, they also have um, Genlock functionality, which is essential for uh, synchronizing with the LED wall as well as the tracking solution on the camera itself. And now moving on to the lenses, our high performance cinema EOS lenses, we've got our brand new flex zoom series here. So this is the 45 to 135. We've also got the 20 to 50. These lenses are already incredibly popular. There's been a lot of buzz about them simply because they have not only the outstanding optical performance you would expect from a Canon lens with, with very naturalistic skin tones, minimal chromatic aberration and distortion, but also they have incredible speed of T2.4 throughout the entire entire focal range. So that's really where we really get into the level where we're getting the performance expected from a prime, uh, a cinema prime in just two lenses. So you're getting all of the focal lengths you get from a traditional prime set with two lenses for an entire production shoot, which is really exciting, helps um, speed workflows and um, also gives you incredible cinematic results. They, they also have very soft focus roll off which um, really helps with scenes like this, where you want to seamlessly transition between real world objects and the virtual. But from a more technical perspective, they also have metadata output. And this is really useful for, for the virtual production too, because we have the Unreal Engine set up here, which is tracking not only the camera position, so we partnered with a, uh, a company called Mosis, who is tracking the, the ceiling. So as I start moving the camera left and right, uh, the parallax of what we're seeing virtually is moving, as well as when I tilt, uh, as well as when I pan. 
But the lens metadata is taking this a step further. Now the system knows what iris we're at, what uh, zoom we're at. So as I'm changing the zoom, I can see the field of view change on the virtual environment, as well as when I'm changing uh, the focal distance. So all of that is helping make the virtual world much more realistic, and it helps make it more seamless with metadata support. So we've got metadata support on our Flex Zoom series with the Limo. We've also got it on our Cine, Cine Servo lenses with 20 pin output. So that's on our entire range of Cine Servo lenses. One other lens that we also have on show here is our Sumi Ray Prime. Now, a lot of experts in the XR field, a lot of uh, DOPs are loving uh, using these lenses because they're giving them a vintage, more organic look, especially when they're wide open. Sure. They give you that touch of softness and delicately rendered skin tones. And that's taking that, um, that transition from real world faces, real world props to the LED screen even further. It's making it silky smooth and much more naturalistic and realistic. And it also suppresses any of those artifacts that you might see on the screen uh, optically with the lens. Okay. So, I mean, it seems like there's a complete solution going on here. Obviously, you've already mentioned Mosis. I'm sure there's a bit more going on than, than just the Star Tracker. Who else have you partnered with in, in this scenario? So yeah, of course, Mosis is a big one with their Star Tracker solution, but we've also got the five by three meter LED wall, which has been provided by Alpha Light, and they're doing absolutely outstanding things with LED walls. This one can reach 1,900 nits in brightness, wow. uh, and it has a 1.9 uh, 1.9 pixel pitch as well. So the resolution is incredible. And we've also partnered with Quasar for the dynamic lighting. So this lighting is actually changing as the scene is changing. So as the time of day is changing, it's also linked to the Unreal Engine. So um, it's a combination of Canon cinema optics, cameras, as well as the Star Tracker from Mosis, Alpha Light LED wall, and finally the lighting by Quasar to have this dynamic, uh, realistic, and incredibly versatile way of shooting. Okay, so I, I mean, I guess if I was gonna wrap it up, I'd say that we've got essentially like, a, it is a virtual world. It's a virtual way of shooting, but in one fixed location. So no longer constrained by waiting for the right light. You can control that any time of day. Uh, no longer trying to get to locations mm -hmm. that you maybe couldn't get to or you can't take a big film crew to. And then this technology, Canon's technology with the, the large format sensors, with the lenses, the metadata, it all combining to, I guess, what open up shooting possibilities? Absolutely. I mean, the future is super exciting. We can't wait for, to see what people are going to do with virtual productions in the future. Um, and w with Canon technology, especially with the lens, it's, it's not simply just about synchronizing with, with metadata and, and functions, but ultimately it's the optical performance of lenses that really does enhance the realism of this. And we're so uh, excited to be part of that. I think it's, uh, it's going to be a very bright future. I think there's so much more that can be done with this and very exciting to see how Canon are going to continue to evolve and integrate and, and develop new exciting tools for us all to work with. Absolutely. Brilliant. Thanks for your time, Aaron. Thank you, Dave. I'm here with Ram Sarup, Product Marketing Specialist for Canon Europe, uh, and he's going to be telling us all about the VR zone here at IBC. Firstly, welcome, Ram. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. So you're in charge of the, the VR zone here. Tell us a little bit about what people can see here. Absolutely. So here at IBC, we're showing off uh, Canon's uh, dual fisheye lens and what we're really able to capture with this lens. So we've got two cameras currently on the market, the EOS R5 and the EOS R5C. And we want people to be able to experience what VR capturing uh, is, is all about with, with these two cameras and this lens. Okay, so within the zone, what, what do we have? So in the zone, we have three separate booths. Inside each of those booths, we have uh, VR headsets from uh, a brand called uh, Vario, and they are very, very high quality headsets. And we have three different videos that we're showcasing in each of these booths. We have content that we've created at Canon Europe, uh, of a Muay Thai fighter uh, talking about uh, his experiences as a sensei to uh, not only young children but grown-ups also and uh, learning sort of like the art of sort of like self-control. We also have content that was created by our colleagues in Japan uh, which is a, a very very vibrant and uh, <laughs> very exciting uh, dance video 
then the third video that we also have uh, is showcasing a fantasy scenario, uh, a narrative piece that was created by our US colleagues. Okay, and I know you've got some partners that you're working with as part of this VR solution. Tell yes, us who they are so, and what they're doing. Uh, like I mentioned, Varia is one of them. So uh, there are many companies that create VR headsets. And what we really, really like about the Varia headsets are that they have uh, not only their own software that's designed to get the absolute best out of these headsets, but you have, for example, the Vario uh, Aero headset that we have here that we're utilizing on two of the booths um, has a mini LED uh, system. So you're getting very, very pin sharp image quality. And we also have their latest and greatest high-end XR3 uh, uh, extended reality headset here as well. So we have content playing anywhere between 4K all the way up to 8K here. Wow, okay. So just in terms of of VR and Canon's offering. You mentioned the lens. Yes. What are the advantages of, of shooting VR with, with Canon? So the unique thing about what Canon's offering customers, usually you would have to have two separate cameras, two uh, fisheye lenses. You would go out there and you'd have to have a rig to be able to utilize those cameras, have them uh, at a set distance to be able to create that content. You would then need to take that footage back to your computer to be able to stitch that footage together, sync the audio, um, and then you can then edit that further in your NLE software. What we're doing that's very unique is by using the R5 or the R5C, which have a full frame sensor able to capture 8K, that VR lens has dual fisheye uh, uh, lenses that will project that image to that one sensor. You're capturing that onto that single sensor and we have a software called EOS VR Utility, which takes all of the hard work away from you you click one button and it will de-squeeze that footage for you. There's no stitching required. So we're creating a very, very simple method for anybody to be able to capture VR content. Interesting. So this is effectively taking a lot of Canon's imaging technology and moving it into, well, what is a kind of a new world with VR? Absolutely. Um, VR, especially during, obviously, the pandemic, uh, people are taking advantage of all these new developing technologies. So Canon being at the forefront, we're the only people that have this particular solution currently available. Um, and with our history being on optical design, we've embedded that into this particular lens design to give you the best experience possible. Interesting. I mean, this, the lens is very odd to look at. A dual fisheye lens on a, on a flat front seems very strange. Can that lens be used on any other cameras? Is it Canon specific? So currently it is Canon specific. We have two cameras that are currently on the market. Like I mentioned, the EOS R5 and the EOS R5C, both cameras being 8K. We want to ensure that we're providing customers with the best image quality possible. Okay, perfect. Uh, and in, I mean, in terms of VR, we, we've said already that it's a kind of, it's a growing medium. We're seeing a lot more of it. From Canon's perspective, where are you seeing VR going? What kind of applications are you seeing? How are you seeing VR move into this industry? So VR is already being utilized within the industry. However, um, the brands that are currently on the market aren't really focusing on the larger format. Uh, content capturing. Uh, so we've spoken to many people uh, here at IBC that are either already utilizing it for uh, educational purposes, for retail, uh, for entertainment, uh, for um, oh, there's so many things. I, um, uh, but we do see uh, an upward projection of more and more people looking into uh, embedding VR as another. Uh, feature within their uh, within their businesses okay perfect so it's the first vr product from canon are we expecting more down the line or can you just say no comment who knows <laughs> no comment. who knows no comment <laughs> perfect okay well look ram thank you very much for your time my pleasure um, and for explaining canon's vr offering to us um, hopefully people find it of interest and, and we see that growth continue upwards i'm here with jack adair product marketing specialist for canon europe we're standing in the BCTV or broadcast TV space, looking at some of the new products that Canon have in this arena. So Jack, welcome, thank you for joining me. Thank you. We're gonna begin with this. Now this looks like a familiar box lens that I have probably seen before, but I'm guessing there's something new about it. You wanna tell me what's going on? There is indeed. So uh, for the sharp eye of you, you'll see UHD Digi Super 122 
AF. Now the 122 obviously is our flagship model, uh, very long super telephoto box lens, uh, but we now have added in additionally uh, autofocus capabilities. Okay, so autofocus in a broadcast space, this seems slightly unusual. We know these guys are very proud of their focusing capability. How do we see this fitting in? What are the benefits? 100%. Uh, so these guys, uh, as we know, they're incredible at what they do. Um, the reason we've added autofocus is obviously in the world of 4K uh, and certain sports where things are particularly fast paced, the subject might be moving near to far. Um, adding in that um, additional tool of autofocus to the lens uh, means that every shot will definitely be in sharp focus uh, for every moment. Okay. Now, is it just autofocus or can they turn it off if they want? Do they get like a best of both? Yeah, so of course with new lens, new controller. So we have the FDJ S31 down there. Um, obviously this gives them the choice to have it on full time uh, as a one shot um, or to have it off to act like a normal manual lens. Uh, and this comes obviously with additional controls as well where you can manage your focus curve, uh, your focus speed and your focus area as well. Okay, so it really is a kind of a, a best of both. Now you said sports, how do we think the broadcast environment is going to respond to an autofocus lens. Do we think they're going to jump on it or do we think there's going to be a bit of reticence? No, um, I think in between. Um, so I think it's going to be very specialist. Um, as I say, it's kind of for fast, pa fast paced sports, things like motorsport, uh, maybe track and field events as well. Um, it's certainly going to have a specialist place. Um, I don't think it's obviously going to go nowhere near replacing any of the existing lineup we have, um, but it certainly has that place in um, being able to capture those moments in fine focus for when they're needed. Okay, and you mentioned a keyword there, you said replace. Uh, obviously, we've got the Digi Super 122. Does that mean this is replacing or is it going to sit alongside? Not at all. They're going to be sitting alongside. Uh, the Digi Super 122 will obviously remain our flagship lens, um, but we obviously now have that version uh, with autofocus for when that's required. Okay, so it's just effectively another tool in the box. Certainly. Lens, if yeah. I can make that terrible joke. <laughs> okay, so, so that's this one out of the way. What else have we got going on here? Okay, so um, at the far end we have the CN20 by 50. Uh, this is a Cine Servo lens. Um, so whereas we're looking at a traditional broadcast style lens here, um, what Cine Servos do is they're a marriage between ENG technology and our optical cinema technology. Um, so it obviously has all the zoom controls, uh, the super telephoto of a thousand millimeter, um, but it also has uh, the 11 iris blades. So you can add that really cinematic look to your productions. And as a lot of live productions now are moving into the world of having super 35 uh, millimeter sensors, or in some cases, uh, full frame, then having that cinematic image for live production um, is certainly elevating people's uh, work to the next level. It is certainly something I think we're seeing across the industry, that kind of broadcast, maybe moving towards a cinematic style and look, uh, maybe making it look more like a film than just a traditional yes. broadcast ENG. And I guess that's where this is going to oh, provide a new tool, mm -hmm. provide new opportunities and, and ways of image capture. Yeah. Brilliant, okay. Uh, and then in terms of the more traditional, I guess, broadcast lenses that we might call them? Yeah, so uh, we've got a UHDXS lens there, the CJ20 by five. Um, this is a perfect, uh, perfect all round lens. So obviously in our range, we've got wide angles, mid focal length, super telephoto. This one sits and covers a, a perfect wide angle um, to telephoto focal length. So I guess a bit like a Swiss army knife of, of one lens does everything. Exactly, yeah. Okay, brilliant. And, and uh, in terms of the benefits that provides, obviously it's a lot more versatile. Yep. People missing out on anything with it or does it provide? No, um, so a bit of everything. So obviously I don't think people are missing out. I think it still gives a perfect tool because it can be used as a shoulder mounted solution if needs be. Um, or obviously if you do need to have it in a studio situation as well, it's also perfectly suited for that too. Brilliant. And then finally, I guess the 18 by 7.6. Yep. That's in our UHD GC series, uh, the general class. Um, so these are lenses that have perfect operability, um, 4K resolution, and they're aimed at those who are making the transition from HD to 4K. So they have all the familiar functions that they found in our HD lenses now in a 4K package. And just, I mean, in terms of Canon's optical quality, I guess this runs across everything. We are seeing this move to, to 4K and potentially beyond. Yep. Canon's optical quality, how are these lenses designed to, to offer those kind of benefits? So within the lenses, um, obviously the glass um, has UD elements. Uh, these virtually eliminate all chromatic aberration, ghosting, flare, things like when you're trying to feel like you're in the moment, might ruin that moment uh, or make it seem unrealistic. Um, so the lenses are handcrafted um, to be to give the finest optical quality that you can possibly achieve. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for taking us through. Thank you for joining us and, and telling us about these new lenses. It certainly seems like an interesting time with this transition, as we were saying, broadcast, cinema, cinema broadcast, but also adding things like autofocus into 
box lenses like this. It's such a, uh, an innovative step and yeah. it'd be exciting to see where it goes in the future. Yeah. Indeed, for your time. thank you. And we're standing in front of the Canon display area. Now, probably little known that Canon make a lot of displays, but you should know more about them. And Aaron is here to tell us all about them. So Aaron, thank you for joining us. Hi, Dave. Hello, good to see you again. Please give us a, a little bit of an overview of what we've got here. Sure, so we've got our latest cutting edge uh, display monitors here. We've got the 18 inch that we launched uh, roughly a year ago, the 27 inch that we're launching this week which is a very unique size. It's a hybrid product that's not only for post-production color, colorists as well as um, uh, visual effects, but it's also for high-end broadcasts such as uh, studio environments. And then finally, we have our flagship 31-inch uh, monitor specifically for, for color grading and post-production. And this one goes all the way up to 2,000 nits. Uh, whereas the performance on these two is very similar at 1,000 nits, which is the industry standard for HDR. So, I mean, in terms of these three, I'm right in saying that they're essentially much the same. Obviously, this one's brighter, yeah. but in terms of their features and functions, yeah. what they can do, they're, they're much the same. It's just the screen size that changes. Absolutely. I mean, uh, the functionality in all these monitors are the same. They all have uncompromised performance and connectivity. So um, they all have grade one panels. Uh, and exceptional contrast ratio. So both of these offer 1,000 nits of brightness. That's not just uh, a small window of 1,000 nits. The entire screen can be that bright at the same time, which is uh, critical for when you're, uh, when you're grading to uh, HDR these days in either PQ or HLG. Um, also, they have very wide color gamuts. Uh, this display, for example, has a color gamut almost the size of Rec 2020. Uh, it's at roughly 90%, which means there's hardly any monitor in the world that can really achieve that. Um, so in terms of the color accuracy, the brightness, the contrast ratio, it really is cutting edge. But where we take it a step further is with our award-winning monitoring tools. So these are functions inside of the display that help you analyze every aspect of the image. So for example, we can start off with the waveform monitor and vectorscope. Very industry standard features that everyone's used to, but Canon always takes it a step further. Our waveform monitor, it can be in uh, HDR, in SDR, or in different log curves from different manufacturers. Um, same thing with uh, the false color. So false color represents changes in exposure uh, through a color scale. But you can change that color scale to how you like it. And for example, skin tones in HDR, because there's such a huge range of brightness for skin tones, uh, to get that right, it's very difficult to do by eye. So with this scale, for example, uh, dark skin tones are supposed to be between 10 to 40 nits on the HDR scale. And you can just add 10 to 40 nit color into here, and then you'll be able to know that all of those skin tones are within the recommendation. So it's not just about the overall exposure of the image, but being able to configure it uh, to, to your liking will help you master it to, and get the recommended skin values that you need. Um, and then that's a more configurable version of waveform monitor and false color. But also we have exclusive tools that no other uh, monitors on, on the market can do. One of my favorite ones is called pixel value check. So this is something that allows you to deep dive into any pixel that you like on the monitor. And then it will tell you what the brightness of that pixel is and where it is in the color space. So if you just wanted to check skin tones or if you had a very high contrast scene, something seemed a little oversaturated, you can see that value, dial it down and, uh, and get it to the correct level. Um, and also we have something called frame luminance monitor, which is um, exclusive to Canon as well. And what that's doing is it's showing you the average and peak brightness throughout a scene over time. So as we're seeing the che scene change, yep. we can see how those brightness values are changing, which is really useful for when you're matching one scene to another. Uh, and there's so many more features in this monitor. We have tons of uh, monitoring tools, including uh, a HDR, SDR compare view. So you can have the monitor can internally have HDR on one side and internally convert it to SDR on the right, which is super useful for broadcasters. So, you know, if you're shooting a live event like the World Cup and you're doing both a HDR and SDR stream, you can double check the values and the waveform for both and make sure that the camera is correctly optimized and uh, exposed for both HDR and SDR. So it's not just that the monitors display a great image that gives you true to life what you're seeing, but it's these tools as well actually in, I guess enhance creativity, 
uh, enhance the quality of the output because they allow you to maximize what you can get. Absolutely, and I think HDR is just expanding everywhere. We're seeing streaming platforms do it, we're seeing broadcasters do it, and we're seeing filmmakers do it, and it's only going to get more and more popular. And there's a lot of benefits to HDR. You get uh, brighter images, you get smoother gradients, um, but one of the um, difficulties is that transition in the workflow. And being able to get the, the critical levels of brightness and color accurate is very important um, from, from the get-go. And at the grading process or at the live filming process for, for broadcast, having these tools available is just making people's lives a lot easier to just make sure that the image is correct and it's going to work correctly on any type of display technology that viewers have at home. Okay, so where are we starting to see these monitors? Obviously, they're, I mean, they're significant investment pieces for a production house. Who are we seeing using them? Where so are we seeing That's them? a great question. It's, it's mainly a split between broadcast and uh, filmmaking. So our 18-inch, for example, has become very popular in the broadcast market. We've had uh, rental companies such as Prestine order a fleet of these specifically for the World Cup this year. So that's for HDR monitoring of, of large events for broadcast. Uh, and it's also great for OB trucks because it's so compact and small yeah, and lightweight. Size. The 27-inch is really unique and we're really excited about it because there's no other monitor of this performance in this size. And it's small enough to be in an in indoor studio for, for broadcast, but it's also large enough for post-production, for, for color grading and editing. We're also seeing a lot of post-production editors and colorists start working from home, yep. and this is a more manageable size for them. And then finally, the 31 inch is your industry standard large scale uh, 17 by 9 monitor, which is for your very high end grading suites where, where you need a large image and um, you're in a dark room and you're doing something for, for Hollywood or something like that. And, uh, and it is very much the best of the best. And it's giving you 2,000 nits of brightness, um, which really is extraordinary. Absolutely. Well, I mean, it's. It's certainly a, a fantastic range, and it's mm. nice to see that that, as I said earlier on, the performance kind of translates across the size. It's not like you're getting smaller and losing out. No, no. You're getting everything that you would get up here, but you've yeah. now got an option for, for different use case sure. scenarios. You say the, uh, the OB truck or the home grader. Mm -hmm. Home grader, but yeah, the, the, yeah. the significant home Might grader. Might be the new term. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the high-end broadcast sure. or, or production suite. It's, it's fantastic to see a range. And, and also with, with what the, the built-in technologies yeah. are that just enhance what, what people can do. Thank you very much for your time. Yeah, thank you, Dave. For taking us through it. Uh, and uh, people should, I guess, come and check them out or oh, contact absolutely. you, contact absolutely, Canon, yeah. get some more information. Yeah, and I, I uh, really endorse that anybody goes to just try these monitors out, contacts their local sales rep, and uh, gets an idea of how these advanced tools can be helpful for them in their workflows. Perfect. Cool. Thank you very All much right. for your time. Thank you.